Building Men is brought to you by Finish the Race Apparel, ftrapparel.com, the creators of all things Building Men, and by Become Stronger Industries, become-stronger.com, the creators of handmade steel maces, hammers, and other badass equipment. Um, narcissism is a funny thing because you try to convince people of your truth instead of what the truth is. And I understand there is three sides to every story, right? And it's my perspective, his perspective, and actually what's going on in the middle of those two things. But narcissism, like I said, is a funny thing because it comes to the point where somebody's trying to convince you that you didn't see with your own two eyes what actually happened. And there's like a convincing of like, you're crazy or your mom put those beliefs into your head. So there was actually a lot of animosity that built up for me over the years um, with my dad. And I'm not going to lie, it still exists to this day. Mm -hmm. I've just figured out how to navigate it without it being a total crux in my life. Building young men who will lead, serve, and change the world. That's our mission here at Building Men. I wanted to thank you for listening to the Building Men podcast. If you haven't done so already, please like, subscribe, give us a rating, and then review the podcast. And then if you could think of anyone that this message might resonate with, consider sharing this episode out with them. If you want to work with Building Men, couple different ways you can do that we work as one-on-one coaches with young men we have a group called the foundation it's a online community that meets with young men every two weeks with some unbelievable guest mentors talking to them about what it really means to be a man in the world today you could also bring us into your school uh, your organization as professional speakers or to set up an in-person building men experience with middle school and high school students Thanks for listening. Enjoy the episode. You're listening to the Building Men Podcast with Dennis and Anthony Miralda, brothers on a mission to help you become the strongest version of yourself mentally, spiritually, emotionally, and physically. What is up, everyone? Welcome back to the Building Men Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Dennis Miralda. I'm joined today by Jill Peterson and Mary Francis. I met these two women it was probably a year ago right now, give or take. Uh, I was introduced to them by Mike Ayala, uh, who was a guest on the Building Men podcast about a year ago as well. And it was interesting because in all the work that I've done with Building Men, one of the most frequent questions I get asked, besides right now, which is why the pink in your logo? I'm going to do a post about that shortly. The other question I get asked is, what about the girls? What are we doing with the girls? What about the girls? Why aren't you doing anything with the girls? And I 100% as a father of two young women, 13 and 15, there needs to be something for the girls. There needs to be a program for the girls, a safe space for them to communicate and to connect and to talk about all the things that they're going through as young women. But I'm not the one that's going to deliver that service to them because I have no idea what it's like to be a young woman. I still don't know what it's like to, you know, to understand women on a deep, on a deep level, still struggling with this to this day which is why I have these guests on the podcast. So Jill and and Mary started up a program called Girls Mentorship, and they are unbelievable human beings. Um, I was on their podcast a while back as well. Jill, Mary, what's up? Welcome to the show. Dennis. Dennis. And realistically, your (laughs) podcast has been one of our most downloaded. So Mm -hmm. um, vice versa, we get asked the same question. What about boys? What about boys? What are you doing boys? What's up with the boys? (laughs) Boys need this too. And it's like, a thousand percent they do. And is a teenage boy going to learn his best from me or is he going to learn his best from somebody who's walked that path and understand what understands what he's going through? And that is definitely the case. Mm-hmm. Without a doubt. And there are certain things that are just overarching, right? Just being a good human being, doing things in service of other people, you know, holding yourself accountable, self-discipline, things like that. But there are certain things that fall into different realms and that's okay. One of the things that I've spoken um, very upfront about is 
boys and girls are different and that's a good thing like we should <laughs> try to make boys and girls the same and i think that's been one of the problems in our society recently is everyone's like we all need to be exactly the same so there is a difference and that's one of the great things in our world so um what i'll do is i'll i'll ask a question and i'll i'll start with one of you and then the other of you can just jump in after after yeah. that first person and we'll just sure. go back and forth that way just to manage otherwise it's not jumping in and then who knows who's who's speaking kind of thing you got it so, oh we're Mary we're good with the tag teaming <laughs> don't you worry and I could tell too that you two, I mean, it's it's very evident the the relationship that you two have, and that's why it works. So we'll we'll weave our way into the the start of the, your relationship when you got to to meet each other. But I want to hear a little bit about the origin story. So Mary, I'll start with you. Tell us a little bit about your upbringing, especially at the age of the girls that you work with. So that middle school age range, late elementary school, middle school age range. Who were you? Tell us a little bit about you and your story. Man, I was a little tomboy. I had way more dude friends than I had girlfriends. And I think that's very typical of that age because girls, being friends with girls in my head, the story that was going around was being friends with girls is hard. They're backstabbing, they're catty, they're gossipy, on and on and on and on. And I just found more connection with guys because I was super sporty. I loved getting my hands dirty. I was literally the only girl who would participate in gym activities. So whether it was basketball or volleyball or football, I was always down to toss it around and that that really stuck with me that's a characteristic and a quality that i still have today but on the side of going through what every other girl was going through at that point in time um, my parents had also just gotten a divorce so they had a extremely toxic relationship in terms of domestic violence so i was dealing with um you know being torn between living with my mom but really wanting a relationship with my dad and not really understanding or being able to conceptualize how or why i couldn't because i saw the things that he did to my mom and my brother i was witness to a lot of the domestic violence bouts that were going on in my house however a little girl needs her dad so i don't that like that human instinct was really alive and well in me and I didn't understand why he was doing this, the things that he was or like why would he why would anybody do that to their family and I still really wanted to be a part of his life and once my parents got a divorce he kind of flew the coop if you will not to go start another family but it was like he was free of the obligation so there was this weird dynamic between the two of us because my mom got full custody so i didn't get to see my dad as much as i really wanted to so there was a lot of turmoil inner turmoil that i was going through outside of just the normal stuff i was going through as a 12 13 14 year old girl and i mean that's that's a lot right there and to come out of that um, with the idea that you wanted to go back and help girls that were going through something similar, all the credit in the world to you. I just did a, a study recently about kids that grow up in fatherless homes. And I had it slanted more towards young men growing up in fatherless homes, but the stats, they work with both sexes. And it was kids that grow up in, in fatherless homes are four times more likely to live in poverty. Oh yeah. Like there's no it's it's really it's remarkable statistics and you wanted that relationship with your father and he just didn't care. He was not up for it himself. Well, and are you I'm assuming you are because you've worked in schools as as in many different positions with the ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, Absolutely. right? And for those of you who are unfamiliar with what those are, it's basically a set of things that happened in your childhood that set you further behind. So um, I think there's 10 of them and it's whether a family member had a drug issue, an alcohol issue, whether there was domestic violence, divorce, um, mental illness in the family, the more aces that you have in a certain period of your life, the further and further behind the eight ball you are. So that means homelessness is an issue. Drug addiction is an issue. Like you're just more likely to not be set up for success in life. So my a score is eight so by all intents and purposes i was not set up to succeed right. in this life which is a really cool nod to the path that i've chosen to travel and the fact that it's like yeah now i'm responsible for me i can't blame who i am today or you know make myself out a victim to what happened in my life 20 years ago i have a decision to make and that's to pick myself up by my bootstraps realistically and turn my 
trials and tribulations into somebody else's survival guide. Absolutely. And it's one of those things where the adverse childhood experience is that I hit it hard when I talk about childhood trauma. Like, what does that mean? And the tra traumatic experiences are those emotional experiences that the kids do not have the capacity to deal with emotionally at the time that they're dealing with them. And, and they really, when you stack them up, the, the stats are staggering. The kids that have like three or more adverse childhood experiences typically I mean, they're set up for a disaster in their lifetime. So for you to say that while it wasn't your fault, it is 100% your responsibility. And I, I often will say then too, it's your privilege to be able to take that and help other people with it. So you're living that life. So Jill, a lot to, to live up to after Mary's Oh my intro gosh, story. My I'm gosh. sorry. You like, should have started what? with me, Dennis. <laughs> really should have. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about, about your background, your upbringing. Was it Little House in the Prairie? Was it, what, what, do you, what was it like? Yeah, mine. So I think the beautiful part of our relationship is how diverse our upbringings are. And the reason why we love to partner in this business together is because truly girls can see themselves in either one of us. We've walked these girls shoes, whether it was through Mary's upbringing or my upbringing. And then really my story, um, I, I had a great upbringing. I had a great family. I, um, I mean, really, it was kind of like, um what you would see a typical family um we were very close knit and uh, nothing really got to me i had great belief in myself i was constantly poured into and really where um my my story really changed up was when i went to college and i got the phone call from my mom and dad and after 25 years of marriage they told me that they were going to get a divorce and really that was like oh my gosh my world came tumbling and crumbling down because i'm like wait a second well now i feel i'm at this age i'm at 18 years old i'm considered an adult and i i kind of felt i felt slighted like i was lied to or i was duped. i was duped um they were keeping secrets from me when i could have taken a bigger conversation and i actually would have really appreciated that before sending me I grew up in Colorado. I went to school in Arizona. So I felt like, oh my gosh, my whole world of what I thought was perfect. Now what? Um, I will never forget coming home for Thanksgiving and I didn't come home to the house that I grew up in. I, I came home to my dad being in an apartment and my mom moving into a very small home. And it just felt like I didn't get to, to I didn't get to mourn. I didn't get to grieve that that family um, value that was instilled in me. And all of a sudden, I'll never forget, like a just a switch flipped for me where it was like, every man in my life is going to treat me the way that my dad treated my mom. So as you can imagine, I'm in college. I didn't have any real relationships because I self-sabotaged and I had no skills or I didn't have anyone to really guide me through my feelings. What I did was how I was taught. You just persevere, you, you push it down, you, you know, sweep that shit under the rug. You're gonna just keep moving on and trucking. So it wasn't until um, I, I had to, I had to be really confronted around. Oh my gosh, is this the life that I want, or can I choose differently? Awesome, and thank you for sharing all that, both of you. I appreciate it. And you, you have a similar, um, you know, theme in that story. And basically, it's like you, you, you were let down by the the man in your life that you were thinking that this is the guy who's going to you know he's he's the protector of the family he's the one who's supposed to provide this level of of security and safety and that was challenge in your upbringing which i'm sure led into your uh you know jill had how you mentioned relationships self-sabotaging and your view of what men were like in the world i'm sure was was mm -hmm. definitely jaded by that so how how if if it did happen how do you overcome that that perspective and those views was it just you know trial and error by meeting people that you know didn't treat your heart like shit or leave or whatever what was that like for i'll start with you jill so what was that like for you to like to overcome that idea about about men and about masculinity it was when i started working at lululemon 
that was the first time that I had someone say, hey, we we're a company that develops leaders in the world. And in order to be your best self, you got to do the work on yourself. And I was like, what? I don't even know what personal growth and development was, but I was so bought into the culture and the people. And I'm like, yeah, I want to be a leader in this company. So I just said yes to opportunities to make myself better. And I went to a three week, or excuse me, three, um, it was a three day weekend intensive, my very first personal growth and development seminar. And man, did I feel so uncomfortable for mm -hmm. three straight days learning about skills and tools and strategies and conversations and learning from other people's stories to realize that uh, my story isn't much different than a lot of people's. Um, and it was like almost like I got to release and break free of just the chains that I've been dragging around my mm. whole life. And what I also got to learn in that is for forgiving my, my dad, um, for what happened and having a really brave and courageous conversation with him and realizing that he did the best that he could with what he had and it's now me hopefully to inspire him to have honest conversations moving forward and to let him know that i still love him so that was the that was the start for me and i haven't looked back and why i mean the freedom that i felt um doing that and just I, I develop and work on myself daily now that's why we do the work that we do with these young girls because if only ha if we only had who we are to these girls when we were their age I mean our story could have been totally different absolutely Mary did you ever have that conversation with your father did you ever have that like closure conversation <laughs> Um, I'll say I've tried, uh, okay. several times. Unfortunately, my dad falls under, he's never been diagnosed with anything, but he had an alcohol issue. He had a drug issue. Um, there's definitely some sort of mental block. I won't go as far as to say it's mental illness, but, um, narcissism is a funny thing because you try to convince people of your truth instead of what the truth is. And I understand there is three sides to every story, right? and it's my perspective his perspective and actually what's going on in the middle of those two things but narcissism like i said is a funny thing because it comes to the point where somebody's trying to convince you that you didn't see with your own two eyes what actually happened and there's like a convincing of like you're crazy or your mom put those beliefs into your head so there was actually a lot of animosity that built up for me over the years um with my dad and i'm not gonna lie it still exists to this day. Mm -hmm. I've just figured out how to navigate it without it being a total crux in my life. So yes, um, I have attempted to have that conversation probably a dozen times and I have not gotten the result that I have looked for in that. So it's, I, I don't urge girls to change who they are in order to, um, you know, circumvent someone else but i realize that i have to change my perspective on the situation because if i continue to try to do the same thing with this and it and expect the same result over and over and over again then i'm the crazy one so it's like how do i move on knowing what i know and being able to forgive the situation because unforgiveness is that old saying it's like you drinking the poison and expecting somebody yes. else to die. So what I did in forgiving my dad was also free me. And that has been such a blessing because it's like, I know what happened and I don't need, um, I don't need his buy-in to provide forgiveness for both of us. That's, that's a different conversation, right? That's reconciliation, which is a totally different concept. Absolutely. And I, I resonates with me. I have, not the same situation with my father, but very, 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 very similar. Um, and understanding what narcissism is didn't happen until after I was divorced and I recognized, wow, like I was experiencing it. I experienced this for 17 years. How did I not see this? And it, you do feel like you're crazy. You feel oh, like you're going God. 
crazy. Yeah. So thank you for, for sharing that too. For yeah. me, a lot of the thing was I needed to write about it too. I knew I wasn't ever going to get the closure that I needed in a conversation. So I just needed to write it out and read it out and really come to terms with it. So it didn't stay stuck in my head. All right. So that we, we got, go ahead. I'm sorry, Jill. I'm uh, Mary. Well, uh, and exactly what Jill said, like it, it comes to the realization that these men, these in these situations are only doing what they knew how to do best. So not that my dad isn't in my life now. He certainly does not hold a large piece of my life. And I am very hands, arms length distance with him. I can see from my per own personal growth and development how sad his life is now that he has pushed everyone away because of his negative tendencies. And that does make me have a little bit more empathy towards what he was and how he was acting in those eras and that when I was that age, because he didn't know any better. And that's by no means an excuse to anyone listening who might be going through something similar. But it's also about holding the position of grace and understanding that he's that way because his dad was that way. And how sad, how awful for him to grow up with a dad like that, and then carry those tendencies on that ancestral trauma, it just yeah. it stays with us until someone along that lineage is cur courageous enough to break that cycle. Right. So Mary, then if you have the ability then to jump in the DeLorean with Doc Brown and Marty McFly and Einstein the dog and go back in time and find yourself at some point in your journey and have a conversation with yourself, um, what would you tell yourself about what's going on in your life? Like, how would you, it, you needed something at that time. What did you need and what would you tell yourself? Buy Apple stock. Just kidding. One hundred percent. You're the second person I said I, oh I talked gosh, to today that, that said the same thing. So funny. I just talked. I just talked. Listen, I just talked to a guy. His name is Michael Santos. He was in jail. But he was like a drug kingpin. He was in jail for 26 years. And while he was in jail, he got convicted when he was in 1987, 23 years old. And while he was in jail, he wrote a book. He got like three degrees. He started a program and he bought stock. And his the stock that he bought was an AOL and Yahoo. And he oh made my millions, God. millions, yeah. and millions of dollars from jail. From jail. While he That's was in jail, amazing. he made millions of dollars. But he said, my one of my biggest regrets is I didn't buy Apple stock. Oh, so the helps. fact that two Funny. people today yeah. on the podcast said that, I just wanted to throw that out there. Well, there are no coincidences. You better go look up the meaning of an <laughs> Apple. Knowledge. And buy some yeah. damn stock today. No kidding. Right. Um, gosh. There's been so many incredible lessons that I've learned. And I think one of the biggest is nobody's going to do the work for you. Like you have to dig in, you have to dig your heels in and actually want the change. If you're going to see the change, because no one is coming to save you. No one is going to put in the miles for you. Like, yes, it's very, very, very easy to play the victim especially when you're underage and you look to your parents or guardians as the people who are supposed to protect you and have your best interests at heart. And maybe that's not what's happening. But once you turn 18, the world doesn't care anymore. And I know that sounds harsh. There are a lot of people that care, but your problems are your problems. No one is going to advocate more for you than you're going to advocate for yourself. And if it's important to you to seek that change, then you're going to have to put in the work to do it. So I would I would say just that to my younger self that it, it doesn't matter who started it, you have to finish it. Love it. And I think it was Gandhi who said, be the change that you want to see in the world. That's a, it's an absolutely phenomenal quote. So Jill, take us into the the origin story of you and Mary connecting. Where did that happen? Tell, tell us a little bit about that. Oh, we met at the wonderful land of Lululemon, the stretchy pant land. <laughs> um, this was in 2016. So I was the store manager at the time and I hired Mary as an employee. And our dynamic as boss to employee wasn't a friendship. I knew I really liked her. I knew I loved, I, I loved her, her go-getter mentality. She was the one person um, that I could count on to give me feedback or at least tell me what was going on. If the team didn't feel comfortable saying their ideas out loud, I could always go to her. And she just had this this mature demeanor that I appreciated in an employee. And she at the time had a CrossFit gym. So she knew being a business owner, what it meant to help other people out so we can win together. And it was in 2018, I left um, 
to go pursue kind of what was on my heart at the time. I didn't specifically know. I knew I wanted to develop people. I knew I wanted to work with moms in some capacity around personal growth and development. That's what I loved doing at Lululemon for almost a decade. And when I left, I was like, Mayor, I am, I don't have a, I don't have a circle. Like I need um, my circle of influence and friendships were, were people I worked for, I, I worked with for the last 10 years. So she she was deeply connected to um, just incredible women who were in business and up to big things. And she was like, come on, girl, come under my wing and I'm going to introduce you to these incredible people. So that was where our friendship really started. And on this journey of me figuring out what was going on, the pandemic, it was 2020, mm -hmm. pandemic happened. And um, at the time before um, it all happened or 2020 came to a pause, um, I was working with girl athletes. So I started with moms. Moms were like, this is really great, but can you work with my daughter? And I had n really no desire to work with girls because I knew what a little shit I was growing up. <laughs> so I was like, I don't think I'm capable of handling these girls. But I said yes, because I was just trying to figure out she's a two on the Enneagram. So she's a yes. I'm woman. a yes woman. <laughs> so um, after I was working with these athletes for a while, um, you know, everything shut down and parents were reaching out around my daughter needs a space are you doing anything? Are you hosting anything? And at the time I wasn't, I'm a mom of two boys. I was doing preschool and kindergarten homeschool. And oh my gosh, that was overwhelming enough. I was like, I can't put any more on my plate, but sure enough, it, I, I got the, the, the little nudge from multiple families that I said, all right, fine, I'll, I'll create something. So um, I created an online camp and I called it Camp Social. It was four weeks. I was inviting all girls, not just athletes, because all girls needed a space. And I didn't want to facilitate the conversation alone. I was like, okay, every week I'm going to invite another girlfriend of mine to help facilitate. I call this one up. I call Mayor up and I said, hey, what are you doing tomorrow? It wasn't like, hey, what are you doing in a week? <laughs> Here's my intention. And just being my, she's just always been my person to say yes. She's like, I got nothing going on. I'd love to do this. And um, that one week we've turned into three and we finished out the call series together. And we looked at each other after those four weeks and we were like, oh my gosh, that was magic from where the girls came um they were just in a place of of, of fear and um, frustration and overwhelm and stress and and quite frankly they were anxious about what was happening mm. and then four weeks later to see just a different confidence in them and they had language to support how they were feeling and tools and strategies we were like we have something here Bing. and that was where girls mentorship was born love it it's so funny the the pandemic it was simultaneously one of the the craziest worst things that's happened and one of the most unbelievable best things that's happened to so many people oh um, i you're so right there's one side or the other mm -hmm. it's and it's uh, most people will tell the story and it's and then covid hit dot 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 and i know right. for me in the middle of a divorce not knowing if I like I was I was jobless pretty much school shut down so I didn't have a, a position going through a divorce which led to I was like almost homeless for a couple months afterwards thinking Oof. oh my what the hell am I going to do and it's I can still remember the you know the the turmoil that I was feeling like how is this even happening and now I'm hosting a podcast and I have Snoop Dogg here as my co-host <laughs> if you're watching this on video it's like nice, it's too. come full circle here so the other thing that I was thinking too, which I love, Joe, when you said to to Mary, it wasn't like, well, what are you doing on June 18th? It's like, what are you doing tomorrow? <laughs> and I just yeah. I just listened to this in a in an audiobook or a podcast recently when the, the and I'll, I'll attribute this in the show notes, but it was don't agree to something that you wouldn't want to do tomorrow morning. Oh, I love that. Right? Because when you think about it, oh yeah, yeah, sure, I'll I'll come on your show or yeah, sure we'll meet out or I'd love to have that meeting. And then the, the next if you're like, okay, if this is going to happen the next day like, oh shit. 
I really don't feel like talking to this guy. I committed. Like right. right. Like, uh, then it, then it's something that you have to do, not something that you want to do. So I've used that as a, as a, a guide for me taking any meeting or meeting with anyone. Is this something where if it's tonight and tomorrow morning, it's going to come up. Is this something that I still, I still wanted to, to participate. And so I love that, that it was like that, like, all right, ready, fire, aim. We're doing this right away. So Mary in that, that connection. So you get through that first summer. At what point are you like, all right, this is, um, this is that we're onto something here. Like this is, this might be something bigger than ourselves, something larger than we thought it might've otherwise been. I mean, honestly, it probably wasn't right away. There was a couple of signs, which 2020 for me was also a year that I chose to get baptized. Um, so at 33 years old, I committed my life to God. And whether you believe or not, obviously you understand the ramifications of that in terms of doing it later in life. So I was very open to signs, miracles, and wonders, however they were coming in. I was like, that's a sign. Oh my God, I'm supposed to do it. Right. So <laughs> I will never forget where I was when Jill made that phone call. Um, just in terms of like my commitment to that walk, I was like, this is a sign. I'm absolutely going to say yes. I right. love Jill. And how could I not say yes to an opportunity like this? The next couple of things that happened were obviously when you have an idea for a business and if you're an entrepreneur, or you do entrepreneurial things, you'll understand this. It's like, you look up the URL that you want right away. And girlsmentorship.com was available and we were dumbfounded. We for were a like, low, low price. For the low, low price of sixteen ninety nine, it was available. And it was like, $16 okay. $16.99? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, a building men of somebody had it and they wanted $10,000 for it. Um, just as a tangent, we also bought boysmentorship.com with the intention of p potentially <laughs> building a wing and Smart it was $1,600. So wow. we were a little, um, you know, we had conversations as to why that was and, you know, patriarch and stuff, but we won't get into that. <laughs> <Wild>. <laughs> Um, but when the URL was available, you know, of course we looked at each other and we're like, Oh my God, that we have to do it. And then what do you do next? You go to Instagram and you see if the Instagram handles available and it was. So for us, that was literally the wind beneath our wings. And I think we both had vacations planned um, to go home. We're both from Colorado to go home to Colorado right after we finished that four week call series. So I think we took July to kind of ideate on the process and we did a hard launch in August. And when we put it out there in August, I think it was the second week of August, just the response that we got because Jill and I have both built communities yes together in terms of our work at lululemon but separate from one another so anyone that knew us as individuals knew us to be girls girls and ride or dies and if you need something call jill call mary like they are down to volunteer they are down to be an extra set of eyes or hands or whatever it was so combining the two of us people lost their ever loving minds <laughs> and it was one of the coolest receptions of an idea that we've ever experienced it was like we had stock right away because we had built up our own personal brands enough like our character our style our substance we matched our words matched our actions we were very integral people were like we're in where do we sign up and it was a perfect storm because it was 2020 so like jill pointed out earlier parents were calling and asking if she had something available because their girls were just lost in the sauce they had no idea extracurricular activities were taken away obviously classroom um etiquette was taken away all of it had just stopped for them so when we put it out there we probably got 10 inquiries right out of the gate for one-on-one -on -one coaching. Parents wanted one-on-one -on -one coaches to help their girls find their confidence again. So we rolled with it. We did one-on-one -on -one coaching for probably the first year of our business before we decided to branch out into workshops. Now we have summer camps and the whole lot, which we can get into a little bit later, but it was almost instantaneous that we knew we had something. And furthermore, it became bigger than us around the same time we make the joke that we're just ozzy osbourne hanging on to the crazy train like we're not we're not the conductor we're not driving it it's driving itself and and we're the ones who are just ah! <laughs> all aboard 
god yeah i'm gonna use that that'll do i gotta write that down that's gonna Please be do. part of the intro into this episode i started oh, using it. It. yes without a doubt so i start I, i'm gonna get shut down for this eventually i i have um uh corn the song blind oh, where god. it's like oh, are you ready any like he so i use that little piece as an intro yeah um so i'm gonna i'm gonna throw some ozzy in there for this yeah one. Do it. so all of yeah. that will be that will be the clip <laughs> that i'm that i'm gonna use so as just a, imagine us the, the the total juxtaposition of ozzy osbourne as you were talking mary i was thinking back you said wind beneath my wings and and it goes i was like in sixth grade when the movie beaches came out with Beth midler <laughs> right and it's like the yeah. like like least masculine movie ever yeah. and i i watched it and i remember i remember like sobbing at the end of that movie when the one woman i forget who who was who played opposite bet miller as the character with the dark hair when she died at the end of the movie i was like crying my eyes out as like a sixth grade boy and i was thinking what the hell is wrong with me at this moment like what what's going on in my head so <laughs> that just brought up a lot of emotion and then you <laughs> juxtapose that with crazy with Ozzy. I'm like, yeah right, okay. snap back, back into it here back. the two snap prophets yeah exactly. the prophet Bette midler said <laughs> right. you are the wind beneath my wings and the prophet ozzy osborne said all aboard <laughs> 100 that was a wild 1980s music ride right there for me on on a high and a low so then you also said mary the whole idea of like girls were lost in the sauce i've never heard it said in that way but agreed and and my work is working with the boys in school that I feel like schools drop the ball across the board. I mean, it really is across the board. One of the reasons why I left public education was because I don't think we're doing a good enough job in schools. I would focus in on what we're not doing to serve the boys in the school, but I don't think we're doing a great job serving the girls in the school either. So Jill, we're not. this question, right? So Jill, tell us about what should schools be doing to help girls in that late elementary, middle into high school range? they need to develop their social and emotional skills just as much as they are laser focused on all the other subjects and developing our kiddos book smarts they equally need to they need to weigh it out equally um we are seeing that kids um i'm reading this incredible book called thrivers and she um, she she talks about um, the difference between strivers and thrivers, and this generation is all about striving, and striving is about um, you know living into your parents' expectations and getting good grades, but not just good grades. It's like you know parents are plopping these children doing campus tours at the age of five and if they don't get into harvard they're disappointing their parents and if they don't have a 4.0 grade point average but if you know they have to earn a 4.3 so just the pressure the pressure the pressure of these kids so um what what they're missing what they're missing and what they need so desperately is friendships and socialization and opportunities for kids to learn skills and tools and strategies to help them when they are overwhelmed and stressed and anxious because right now um, we're just pounding these kids so hard that they, when they come up for air, they're like, well, I look back on my high school career, my middle school career, and all I think about was all I did was study and try to get good grades. That's sad to me. That's sad to us because life is not about just grades. It's about living your passions and exploring what your talents are. And if we don't ki give kids the opportunity to do that, they're truly uh, what we feel is they're, they're going to be lacking and behind the eight ball in life. 100% agree with that. So Mary, I give you an opportunity. I'm the superintendent of a school district and I say, I'll give you a hundred grand to develop a course that all girls need to take when they're in middle school. What would that course be? I mean, luckily we're in the middle of developing courses right now. <laughs> and honestly, what Jill touched on is social emotional learning, which has five competencies. It's self-awareness, um, self-management, social awareness, relationship skills, and responsible decision-making. Those five competencies don't only matter to the girl or the school that she's in, right? It matters to communities. It matters to neighborhoods. It matters to our whole world. Because as a society right now, if you're the superintendent of this 
this school, like you have to meet certain stipulations. Test scores have to be what they are, which is why you're driving them so hard, which is why you ride teachers so hard, which is why SEL is at the bottom of teachers to do lists, right? It's another thing on their plate that they don't have the time or resources to focus on. But as a community, as a society, we're sitting here and we're pointing the finger and we're saying, kids don't have the skills. They can't even look me in the eye. Kids just don't want to work. Our, the workforce is taking a plummet, right? Gen Z is the hardest generation to work with, but we're not taking our own responsibility in that because realistically, Gen Z has had phones in their faces since the second they were born, right? They are only doing what they were taught and we're not giving them enough credit for how capable and how smart they actually are. We're actually not giving them the space to explore or the potential to explore how smart they really are because they're the ones that are gonna be solving all the problems that we have right now if we give them an opportunity to do so. So the courses that we would develop would be in very specific order, what we just named in those competencies that would address things like the lack of confidence, that would address things like a lack of self-awareness and how a lack of self-awareness impacts and affects everyone. We liken that to somebody who leaves their grocery cart out in the middle of a parking lot, right? That has an impact on everyone, not just you who left it out there. Maybe you left it behind somebody's truck and now that person has to move it. Maybe you're the employee that has to go around the parking lot wrangling all these random ass grocery carts when they could have just been put where they're supposed to go, right? These kids are gonna be our lawmakers, our policy, policymakers, our lawyers, our judges, our, our people in Congress, and we're going to depend on them to create a society that benefits all of us, yet we're so caught up in what they can't do. So the, the courses would be to support the girls, but there would also have to be a component that supports the teachers and the parents as well. So the conversation could continue to be bigger than what it is right now. Love the grocery cart analogy there. It's my kids. I mean, they know I'm like, I am so hell bent on like, <laughs> I will go and like confront people who don't do that. And like, that is, that's a, like a social piece that you're basically saying like, fuck you. I don't care. I'm not putting your part away. Right. It's, yep. it, it bothers me to the core of who I am. So I will go out of my way and I will put the other carts away just because Same. like someone needs to do that. It's also like you're in the bathroom and you, you know, crumple up a paper towel and you throw it and you miss the garbage you know, can. The can. You yeah. could you could potentially walk out and no one will ever know, but then someone else is going to have to do something because you didn't do what you were supposed to do. So like, are you the type of person that's going to do that? And it's it's not just what you say; it's what kids see you doing. It's you mm. setting the example by your your actions, um, by empowering them to watch you doing certain things. Things so, are caught, not taught. One hundred percent, absolutely agree with that. So. Jill, on your website, you guys have the these five E's, educate, equip, empower, engage, and energize. Talk to us a little bit about like the, the power behind those five E's. Those E's, oh, we love a good alliteration, mm -hmm. but truly that is what kids, teachers, um, businesses, when they hire us, that is what we as a duo want to deliver but also in exchange that they're all that they're going to um to at least experience so that they can go and be better we always want to leave people better than how we found them now are they going to embody all four no. we'll have to edit that part out <laughs> hang on The doorbell. the doorbell it's all right um i can the doorbell rang of course the dogs are going wild do you That's want me good. to keep going keep going i mean okay. you, you were talking about all <laughs> the, all, all four. the four e's okay so um the the ease we would love for people to be inspired by them and we we don't expect them to get all of them down in us talking to them one time. Mm -hmm. But again, if we can leave people better than how we found them, we always love to say, 
just do one thing. Like what's one thing that you can take from our conversation or what we've been talking about and apply it so that again, you can be a part of the solution of the social emotional learning model versus just being like, well, um, this was really great and I'm not gonna take responsibility for how I show up in the world. We wanna empower more people to know that it's them like just what mary was talking about in her um like if she were to go back and and tell her younger her younger self around hey you are in choice around how you show up like just don't you want to be better not only for you but the people around you the people that are watching you like that's that's what those ease mean to us is empowering people to know that they can take responsibility to do better be better for everybody around them and just having it verbalized in that way makes a lot of sense and people can get an idea about what you're about by going through that on your website we'll definitely link that into the show notes as well yeah. so a couple more questions before i let you guys go first is I am the father of two girls. Uh, one's a freshman in high school, the other one's in seventh grade. Um, as as a parent of girls, like what's something that, that I have wrong or that you see that parents of girls in that age range have wrong, that they think they know what they're talking about, but they really, they, they're, they have some misconceptions? I mean, there's a few things and I want to touch on what you said earlier in around your divorce. We work with a lot of divorced parents and unfortunately they forget that they are the example to their daughters. And there's a lot of shit talking that goes on back mm -hmm. and forth between mom and dad. So it's like, well, your mom didn't do this or your dad's a deadbeat. And it's like, man, how do we maintain the same team mentality regardless of if we got divorced or not for the sake of the kids like you don't have to like your ex-spouse in any way shape or form but i know that you love your daughters your kids whomever is listening to this enough to not make that their experience because with my parents getting divorced whenever i did spend time with my dad that's all he did was talk poorly about my mom and that gave me such a sour experience whenever like Jill, like whenever I looked at men in my future, that was really hard for me to conceptualize or really understand like why, because I saw fault where there was fault, but what he was saying was completely different. And my mom wasn't the same. She wasn't out there totally throwing my dad under the bus. So there was this power struggle that I was in between and that's not fair to your kids. The other thing is being friends with your kids that's not something that you get the luxury of being until they're old enough to be your friend, which usually is later in their 20s. You are the parent, you know best. And if you don't know best, guess what? You can circle back around and clean it up, but you have your kids' best interests at heart because their brains aren't fully developed. That frontal lobe doesn't fully develop until they're 25 to 30 years old. So their ability to make the best decisions possible or to to critically think about an outcome just don't exist. So yeah, do you want to be the cool mom? I'll quote freaking mean girls there. Like you don't you don't want to be a regular mom, you want to be a cool mom. Same with dads. You don't get that luxury. You didn't make a decision to have a child to be their friend. You made the decision to have a child to raise a capable, responsible adult. Absolutely agree with that. So that's what parents have to recognize when when they're thinking about their their girls, especially what we have wrong. I remember, I'm trying to think about the first time that I really thought about the opposite sex. Fifth grade, shout out to Jenny Heck. She was my girlfriend in fifth grade. <laughs> Jenny! Jenny Heck, yeah. And I remember always like, it, it was like this mystical creature, girls in, in middle and, and into high school, like really not knowing like what to say, what to do, what to think. Also recognizing that a lot of the girls really didn't know what the hell they were doing either. They just, they were a little bit more um, mature than the boys at that age range. So what do boys need to know about girls? Like what are the things that they boys have wrong when they think about girls? Oh man. Well, I mean, it you could write on... a book about it. I'm sure. <laughs> well, it's interesting because we do hear when we work with our girls, we hear that boys really are contributing to the girl's overwhelm and lack of 
positive self image and just it's it's heartbreaking it's heartbreaking to know that um not only was it the way like yes was it hard for us when we were growing up yes it was however we didn't have social media and social media now can absolutely destroy a girl's reputation as well as a boy's reputation so what we've seen is snapchat in particular um if a girl is sharing something with a boy he'll screenshot it and then just put her on blast with all of his friends. And then she comes to school. Maybe it's not even at school, maybe a few minutes, hours later, she's getting wind that what she, you know, said, provided whatever it was is now on blast. And it has literally ruined girls self image and the way that she looks at herself or the or, or friendships. It's been awful to witness. So I think that's something for parents to know the power of social media and the digital footprint that if you're going to contribute to play on social media, just knowing the ramifications of what you put out there can absolutely live on forever. Well, and good kids make bad decisions. I think a lot of people who are throwing stones in glass houses around the subject of social media love to just say, well, don't let them have it. Man, if that was the solve, amazing. You just won a Nobel Peace Prize. It's like saying, saying, don't worry about it to somebody with anxiety. It's like, they're going to worry about it. <laughs> we live in a digital world. So it does pay for parents to introduce social media in some way, shape, or form to their kids so they understand what being a good digital citizen is like. But we good like i said good kids are going to make bad decisions because of the lack of brain development so maybe what jill is talking about in terms of what was sent is a nude photo right we all know that porn exists and kids are seeing it younger and younger and younger and that is messing up their ability to make decisions but girls and boys like you already pointed out have no idea what the landscape looks like and they're equally as nervous around one another so it's like hey send me a picture of your boob and the girl's like oh my god maybe i should and she does and then it blows up in her face because of what jill just described in terms of it being put on blast and it's like we, do we punish our kids for decisions like that or do we recall what it was like to be in their shoes because we also made decisions like that? Absolutely. And I, thinking back to my own experience in middle school, like if I had a phone, I would have been asking that question. I, I know I would have, as as any young man would have been doing the same exact thing. It's it's interesting. I read a stat. I listened to it was on on Jay Shetty on um on on purpose podcast and he yeah. was talking about just you know social media and its impact and our brain development and then they they brought up the idea of of pornography and something along the lines of the average 13 year old boy today in 2023 has the ability to see as many naked women in a 24 hour period that the you know most powerful king in the history of the world would have seen in his entire lifetime Mm -hmm. or, or something along those yeah, lines. And then it, it totally just, it changes the the way that their brains are developing. And the other thing is uh, girls are, are interested in the same thing. It's just in a little bit of a different way. Um, I was sharing with Julie, my girlfriend last night about, I remember when our kids were introduced to phones for the first time and, you know, we take the phones and look at them, like what was the search history? And it was actually my youngest who, I don't know, she was in like sixth grade or fifth grade and she looked up boobs like that was like, she yeah. looked, it was like Google images and she looked up boobs. That was like the first thing of, and I, I thought I'd be talking to my son about it, but I was actually talking to my like, you know, nine-year-old daughter about yeah. internet pornography. Um, but it is, it's, it's what the parents are doing. What are the parents showing them? How are they um, expressing to them our morals, our values, and what is acceptable and not acceptable? So what is, Jill, what's the age that I, that's, it's a good time to introduce social media to a young woman? Um, we are big fans to wait until eighth grade, wait okay. until at eighth. least, at least wait until eighth. Um, and we will hear pushback from some people around, well, what if my kid is the only one who doesn't have it? We hear that a lot and we're like, but can he still, or can she still communicate with her friends without social media? 
Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Phone calls, text messages. It's not like you're just, you know, completely taking a phone away from them. But I'm telling you, we have seen we have seen it at its worst. And the 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 research is coming out more and more and more where parents need to wake up to the severity of of what social media does to kids brains it's wild so at least we say wait until eighth if Love not it. i mean if you can be the parent to be like you know what they're just not having it until they leave until this house. they leave this house and there are several solves there are several solves so that's not an excuse like my kid feels left out good your kid should feel left out from all of the terrible shit they're going to see online mm -hmm. right people live stream some of the worst shit in humanity yeah. and your kid is privy to seeing that so tr you're they're 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 getting left out from trauma from upset from heartbreak they're leave them out that's our answer is good. I hope they feel left out because they should feel left out. Interesting. It's funny. I, I remember back to being in like fourth or fifth grade and my parents were watching the movie Dirty Dancing and I yeah. was not allowed anywhere near the room when we were watching Dirty Dancing. Now I'm thinking like that is so innocuous compared to some of the things right. that the kids are seeing right now. You know, Patrick, Patrick Swayze holding up uh, Jennifer Grey in the water. Like that was like so scandalous back when <laughs> I was in elementary <laughs> totally. school. Totally. Mine was White Men Can't Jump. I wasn't allowed to watch it, but my brother and my dad were watching it and there was this other room that I could see it from. And oh, I was like, so sneaky. <laughs> Oh, yeah, of course. Kids will find a way. That's why we do what we do. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. All right. So what I wanted to do is give you an opportunity to share with us what you have going on right now, your programs, your online stuff, and then where we can find you. Absolutely. So if you are the lucky, lucky resident of any zip code in Arizona, then you can join us for our summer camps, which are happening in June and July. We have three different week long sessions for girls who are 10 to 13. And basically everything that we covered here is what we'll be touching on in summer camp. And we'll do that through different activities, conversations. We're bringing in different speakers. It's really important for us, much like it is for you and your building men community for these girls to hear from other community liaisons, right? Other business owners, other incredible women with different experiences than Jill and I, and girls that look different, women that look different than Jill and I do. We want every girl that attends summer camp to be able to see themselves in either us, our speakers, or our volunteers. So you can find the dates for that on our website. But outside of that, we know there's a huge need for the work we're doing outside of Arizona. So if you were somebody that shook their head and you're like, well, I'm not the lucky, lucky resident of a zip code in Arizona, that's okay too, because we are really busy behind the scenes formulating some online offerings for both parents and girls to really do side by side. Because what we know in teaching social emotional learning is much like teaching somebody how to work out. If they spend an hour hour a day with us in the gym, but then they go directly to McDonald's for the other 23 hours, the work they put in inside the gym isn't going to matter, right? So we need parents to be looped into these conversations as well. Um, so we'll have a wait list on our website. Um, for you to receive notification for when these courses come out. We'll have very specific courses around how to develop confidence, what the pitfalls are, why they lose their confidence, what you can do to help them gain it back, um, and where you need to kind of let them stumble to figure it out. We'll also have courses around coping. We hear a lot of this around transition periods. So um, from elementary to middle school is really tough on girls from middle school to high school. Maybe you are getting a divorce and that transition for your daughter has been hard. Maybe you're moving. So um, a large course around coping skills. And then by far and away, one of our most requested, asked for, asked about um, concepts is around friendship. Friendship is really difficult for girls in this in this age range. So we have a course coming out around how to be a good friend, what the different types of connections are, knowing who you are yourself and what you're looking for in terms of friendships, as well as boundaries, values, those type of things. So all of that will be on our website as well. That is tremendous. I love the work that you're doing. Thank you so much for doing the work that you're doing. We'll put all that information into the show notes so listeners of the podcast can check everything that you're doing out. Uh, so final question, I'll ask Jill first and then Mary, if you could follow up after Jill's done. 
if somebody's listening to this episode, they got a lot of value in your stories, um, advice you have for parents, for teenage girls. What's one thing that someone could do after they hit stop on this episode? And by doing this one thing, it could really change the course of their life, the trajectory of their life. What's that one thing, Joe? I'm probably going to still Mary's. Uh, She's going to be like, wait, that's mine. That's mine. Um, is take radical responsibility for your life. Radical. It will change your life. It will help you remove the blinders and, and see fully what's around you. Um, and for you to really be your best science experiment. Love that. And really to couple that, um, I would say question everything. Why are you doing what you're doing? And does, does that serve who you are right now? Because I mean, science, scientifically speaking, this isn't this, I'm not making this up. 95% of our day is spent on autopilot, right? We are so such habitual creatures that the programming that we got from our parents and they got from their parents and they got from their parents is typically how we're operating. And generally speaking, it doesn't serve the person we are today. Or so, who we want to yeah, be. Yeah, or who we want to be, exactly. So you have to, if you're going to impact somebody else, namely your kids, you have to look at yourself first. Look in the mirror and question every single action that you take on a daily basis and why. Love it. So on behalf of Marty McFly, Doc Brown, Bette Midler, Ozzy Osbourne, Patrick Swayze, Jennifer Snoop. Gray, right? <laughs> and Snoop and my, and my co-host Snoop Dogg here. I want to thank Jill Peterson, Mary Francis, Building Med Audience. Go one step further than you thought you could go. We'll see you next time on Building Men. Thank you.